Welcome to week three. We're all getting wrecked for good and wrecked for God. And this week we're going to focus on chapter four, which is saint now, sinner no more, and chapter five, better drunk than sober. And again, I wanna encourage you to read because we want to learn how to live as a joyful, spirit-empowered, dare I say, drunken saint of God. Hang on. <laughs> Remember on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out? They thought they were all drunk with new wine. That's what happens when God moves inside. I mean, He is the God of the universe. So our question, how do we do that? How do we live as a spirit-empowered saint who overcomes sin and yet delights in ordinary life, like has a good time? There's only one way, union with Jesus. He is the way. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. And He's moved right on inside of us by His Spirit. But we need some serious cleaning up and no, I'm not talking about cleaning up of your sinful self because Jesus' work on the cross actually did all that. I think we need a lot of cleaning up of our theology. You know, many of us are drowning in sin management, you know, trying to control, trying to be accountable, you know, trying, trying to have the boundaries. Not all bad. I'm just saying some of we're drowning in sin management. Some of us are in real captivity to sin. Many just give up and sadly give in. Let me tell you a story. For many, many years, I believed, and I'm sorry, I taught this. So I'm sorry if you heard this from me, that there are like two dogs living inside of us, a bad dog and a good dog. But they're always fighting and you didn't know on which day who was gonna win, the good dog who helped you be a good person or the bad dog who compelled you to you know, act evil, commit sin. The problem with that theology, it, it was based on a lot of people's experiences, okay? <laughs> like many people didn't live in victory over sin and they actually felt like there were two dogs living inside of them. And we even use scriptures like from Jeremiah, oh, the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. Well, I'll never forget the call I got from my youngest son and I share this story in the book where he announced, mom, did you know we no longer have a sin nature? I'm like, has the guy become a heretic? You know, he was off at college at Eastern Illinois University. I thought he had some serious head injury from football or he joined some cult. I, I'm telling you, this was serious stuff. But you know what I have found? When that kind of reaction happens, I stop. I go, okay, Holy Spirit, what's going on? And I opened the Bible and suddenly I saw it was all over the place. Christians were addressed as saints, as holy ones. And Jesus even had the audacity on more than one occasion to tell somebody, go and sin no more. No, Jesus didn't say, now go and try harder not to sin or go and just sin just a little bit. No, he said, go and sin no more. What? <laughs> yeah, that happened. You can read that in John 5, 14, where he healed a man and then said, see, you're well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. I discovered he was foreshadowing this amazing new identity that would be made possible by his finished work and spirit empowerment. We began a long journey and it's been since about 2010 for us here as a community of faith. And a significant part of that journey was learning to no longer just be sin conscious people, but savior conscious. And that was a, a, an amazing deposit as God sent different speakers who, who told us, no, he's unleashing a revival of righteousness. Again, there was a lot of confusion, but we all committed to Holy Spirit, teach us. I love how the focus is on the Savior who took our sin, but we still had this tension, you know, of, of still sinning. But did you know you don't need a sin nature to sin? No, Adam and Eve didn't have a sin nature, but they sinned big time. 
I mean, Jesus himself, why, he was tempted to sin, or he's not a true savior or a true human, right? But he was without sin. Now, most Christians would agree, Jesus forgives our sin, but I, like so many, I didn't know that Jesus had already forgiven all my sin, past, present, and future, all of them gone, and that my sin nature was gone too. But this ends up being a huge deal. Why? Because when we think that every time we do sin, then we have to like grovel and confess and, and get forgiven again, and, and the, the focus is totally on me and what I'm doing and not on, oh Jesus, yes, I did sin, but I thank you, that's forgiven. I thank you, you've made me a righteous daughter. I thank you for your work of, that you did on the cross when you took away all the sin of the world. Oh, I'm so thankful. So instead of being sin conscious, save your conscious. Oh yeah, he didn't just kind of cover up sin. No, 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 he took away sin. That's amazing. And that has brought so much incredible change to our lives and joy to our lives to know our sin nature cut off. Yeah, gone, removed. And we've been born anew. We not only have a new nature, I have a brand new heart and a brand new spirit who empowers us to live in our new identity as a saint, sinner no more, <laughs> saint now. And again, do I express sorrow when I mess up? Absolutely. Do I ask for help? That's when we need the help from the Holy Spirit to live as the righteous sons and daughters that he has so gloriously made us by the power of his blood. Again, not just sin gone, but he gives us a brand new righteousness in our very being. Now, that's a big word. And it's all over the Bible. L let me tell you a story just to illustrate uh, the importance of our embracing our righteousness and our righteous identity and, and how that all works in making sure our union with Jesus is strong and healthy. So I had a good friend, I'll call her Stacy. that's not her name, but she was a strong, vibrant Christian, Christian and she refused to date any guy who was not on the same spiritual wavelength. She was committed to a serious relationship that followed what the scripture said. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Okay, that was great. She believed that was true from 2 Corinthians 6.14. That was until she met Alex. Why, he swept her off her feet. Now, she feigned, uh, he feigned a slight interest in faith, but the rest of us knew, nah, it wasn't genuine. He was an unbeliever. This was an unequal yoke. A healthy partnership was an impossibility. Oh, but there was a lot of chemistry. Within a few months, they were engaged. Despite all of her pleadings and prayers, they were married. And I'm sad to report his darkness swallowed her light. The marriage ended. Divorce was the tra tragic result. But why do I tell you this sad story? Why? Because it illustrates the truth that we cannot and should not be unequally yoked. Don't, we're the bride of Christ. We have to embrace our identity as a saint, as a righteous daughter or a righteous son. We're no longer sinners. For our relationship with Jesus to survive, for it to be a healthy partnership, embrace our true identity as righteous sons and daughters. Why? There's no partnership between righteousness and lawlessness. If we continue to believe, oh, I'm just a lawless sinner, saved by grace, a woeful servant struggling to be good, or even a careless sinner who lives recklessly, our union with, our marriage to Jesus will be sick at best, short-lived at worst. And that's why Jesus did the almost unthinkable. He became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
Wow. I'm telling you, many people do not like this strong emphasis on our righteousness. But Jesus is our righteousness. He paid a huge price for us to be equally yoked with him. <laughs> oh, this is no mere imputation of righteousness. That's often taught. Oh, it's just a little Christ-like cover-up of our cruddy self. No, 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 no. We take on Christ's righteousness. I tell you a whole lot more on that in the chapter. But I want to go on and just say, how then do we live as a joyful, spirit-empowered, drunken <laughs> uh, child of God? And that's the importance of the spirit, which is why I love how Paul said in Romans, those who think they can do this on their own, they just are uh, obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle, but never get around to exercising, exercising it in real life. No, those who trust God's action in them find that God's spirit is in them, living and breathing God. Obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious, free life. Yes, <laughs> that's so much what God wants for us. He doesn't want any dualism in our life. You know, like separating spiritual things from earthly things and not just like focusing on overcoming sin, but enjoying all of life. I call it daily drunken delight. <laughs> but again, religion, they like to separate the natural world, the spiritual world, the spirit, the, you know, the, the more um, biblical things from just the ordinary life. I'm telling you that causes untold harm just in how we relate to the planet, not to mention 99% of folks, even many atheists would believe it's more spiritual to go to church than to play baseball. No, no, we are the church. And when we play baseball, we are the church playing baseball. And the work of the church is not just preaching, evangelism, singing worship songs. No, the work of the church, it's farming, coffee roasting, manufacturing, selling, baking, brewing single malt scotch. I mean, take your choice. You know, it's all good. No, there's so much joy, so much joy. You know, Jesus wants to be included in all of life. And it's so important as righteous sons and daughters that there, that righteousness is not just lived out, you know, when we study the Bible, go to church or pray. No, it's lived out whether we're shopping, you know, we're swimming, we're wood, woodworking, we're playing baseball, no matter what we do. I have been so encouraged as I have detailed in my journal each day all the things that Jesus has totally enjoyed. I mean, I was shocked to discover he enjoys shopping. He's actually really good. He's got a good eye on selecting things. <laughs> and you too, like you can begin to note, where is Jesus just enjoying daily life with you? And yeah, I think you'll discern a twinkle in his eye about how he loves whatever it is that you're doing. For the most part, and if he doesn't like it, he'll let you know, okay? <laughs> he loves to do life in union. Yeah, recently I loved riding the chairlift uh, up a mountain in Wisconsin with two of my granddaughters. And Jesus just had the best time with us as we laughed and, and talked about, you know, making the, the, the ski down the slope or watching all creatures, great and small, on PBS. Just so much fun doing life with Jesus, life in the spirit, no matter what it is. I want you to remember, he never leaves. He always loves. He gently leads. Why don't we learn and follow if you want to live a joyful, spirit-empowered life in every way, one whose sin nature is cut off and you are filled with the righteousness of Christ. <laughs>